My husband keeps chopping his fingers off. The first time it happened it was a surprise. I heard an awful cry come from the kitchen and I sped through nearly slipping on the hardwood floors as I went. He stood, doubled over in pain, clutching at his palm that was dripping red with fresh uncongealed blood. His severed finger lay next to an abandoned knife amongst a pile of sliced onions which were now stained bright scarlet. I nearly fainted. There was so much blood that I could almost taste the undertones of metal and iron that hung in the air. It's all right. Stay calm. I found my head in the chaos. I grabbed some frozen peas from the freezer and with concealed disgust, slipped the finger into a Ziploc bag with some of the icy green balls. Neil seemed stuck stiff in shock. He didn't say much on the way to AE, he just stared at the stump where his finger had been with a morose sort of dedication. A few hours later we were home. The doctors managed to reattach the finger and they bandaged it up tightly to heal. I thought that was it. I thought this would be the end of the severed finger saga a funny story to tell our grandkids and a reason to buy the pre-cut onions in future. Neil had other ideas. A few weeks later I heard another cry, this time from the garden. Neil was doubled over in pain by the half-trimmed hedge and the garden shears had been discarded in a flower pot. I could see even from the patio doors the little white thumb poking out from the pile of crisped autumn leaves at Neil's feet. Not another one. It was an accident. He cried out. I remember thinking how obvious his statement was. Of course it had been an accident. Who cuts off their finger deliberately? We went to AE again and the same doctor attempted to reattach the thumb. It wasn't such a simple task this time and Neil was given the awful news that he would most likely have reduced mobility due to gnarliness with which the nerves had been severed. We went home and watched some TV. I thought it was strange then, but Neil was clumsy that he had injured himself twice in a month did not entirely surprise me. The third time I started to think something strange was afoot. This time there wasn't even a cry. Neil stumbled through into the bedroom early one morning with a bloody hand held up for me to see. It was covered in bright red blood that seeped into the barely healed scars from his last accidents. I was becoming desensitized now. I felt nothing but suspicion how had he allowed this to happen again? The sight of severed fingers was as normal to me now as the look of the sun and the sky. I groaned and rolled out of bed. What did you do this time? Where's the finger? I hissed. Table saw. I was trying to make those shelves you wanted. He bit his lip. It fell in the pile of sawdust. The table saw? At this time of the morning? I retrieved the pinky finger and washed the sawdust off it and slipped it into a pack of frozen sweet corn. We were all out of peas as a result of his two previous accidents. Are you doing this on purpose Neil? I asked him through gritted teeth in the car on the way to the hospital. We looked at each other with narrowed eyes. The sleep was still crusted in the corners of my eyes and I had not even had the time to brush my hair. I should have been in bed, not chaperoning Mr. No Fingers to the hospital for the third time in two months. Why would I cut my fingers off on purpose? He snapped back at me. Three fingers in the space of two months. That's more than clumsiness that's crazy. I gripped the steering wheel so tight my digits turned white. It was reattached with swiftness though the doctor seemed as suspicious as me as he scanned over Neil's medical records. Three fingers on his right hand now bore ghastly scars, all at varying stages of healing. The fourth time I knew he was up to something. I heard him in the kitchen late one night. I snuck out of bed and peeked at him through the half-shut door. He was meal prepping, something he often did. There were piles of broccoli and cauliflower and the scent of salmon lingered in the air. He was humming to himself to pass the time as he grated something carefully into a glass Pyrex dish. I could see it was red red cabbage maybe or... Neil. I called and he jolted upright, the glass fell to the floor and smashed into a thousand little pieces and then I saw it little strips of flesh and blood. He had grated his... He had grated his finger. I can explain he started. No you can't. Take yourself to the hospital. I fled the house in a hurry and went to stay with my mums. I committed myself to have nothing to do with him going forward, so I sent my brother to pick up my stuff. All the good memories, of our wedding in Ibiza, our honeymoon in Barbados and the funny way his mouth would tilt when I'd make a joke all of it was but a dim undertone to the stench of fresh blood in the image of his bloody nubby digits. He left me text after text. He called me constantly. When I blocked him on every avenue of communication he transferred pennies into my bank account with pathetic 20 character messages. I'm sorry. Love you. He'll stop. Over and over, until I must have accumulated 20 pounds worth of pennies. I know what you're thinking. Ignore him, go on with your life, you don't need him. 
But love is strange, it is like a chain at times, and a positive pregnancy test, well that's a handcuff. He was different for a while after I returned. Though he was missing a finger from the grating incident, he made no further attempts to sever a digit. We had our baby, a beautiful boy we named Mike, and life was perfect for a small while. Then it happened again. A cry in the middle of the night. I sped through, not even entertaining that it might have been another finger incident but it was in this time it was a finger from his left hand, not his right and he claimed that the digit had fallen down the trash compactor. The doctor suggested psychiatric care and I concurred, but Neil insisted it was an accident that he had the worst luck. Then it happened again. And again. And each time the finger would be gone or lost. On one occasion it had happened while Neil had been at work. His index finger had gotten stuck between a door at the vet's office and apparently a dog had eaten it after. Another time he had misplaced it in the freezer. My final straw was when he lost his wedding ring. It went down the trash chute what do you want me to do, go down after it? He yelled. I want you to stop cutting your fingers off is that too much to ask I yelled, so loud I figured all the neighbors in our high rise building heard. Our baby woke up from his nap and began crying and I wondered if I looked like a volcano as I felt like I had become one. He had barely any fingers left on his left hand now and only a few on his right. They were hot tears running down my cheeks as I all but collapsed to my knees. I wanted it all to stop. Why are you doing this Neil? Please just tell me. Why? I'm working on something. He mumbled, finally ending the charade that it was all some giant spate of horrendous luck. I'm taking Mike and I'm going. And I did. I found the key to the damn handcuffs and I hightailed it out of there. My family were great, they helped me on my feet. Unlike last time I left Neil didn't try to send me any messages, he didn't fight for custody of Mike and he paid his child support on time. I never looked back, my ex who kept lopping his fingers off became just a distant memory. I didn't see Neil at all not for an entire year. Then I saw it, a strange transfer in my bank account from Neil. Three pounds and thirty-three pence and a message it it. There was another payment a few days after with the same amount and another message this time come easy. I felt an uneasy build in the pit of my stomach, but I ignored it and continued on with my life. I would not be sucked into Neil's absurdity. I would not, but absurdity has a radius effect, stray too close, even just once, and it latches onto you for dear life. There was a knock on my door one day. I thought it was a parcel but it wasn't. He was wearing a black sheet. He didn't really look like Neil anymore all of Neil had been carved out. He had no fingers on either hand, he had only short nubs where digits had once been. He didn't have a nose, just a nub where it had once poked out. He had no ears, just small little lumps with holes in the middle. His pallor was pale and sickly and he was thin, almost as if he had never eaten. When he saw me he grinned, a wide and human grin that must have hurt his cheeks and he handed it to me a bouquet. Except it wasn't a bouquet of roses nor of pansies or tulips. Nothing nice was in that bouquet. When I saw it I felt my grasp on reality drift from me. All these years, all these sleepless nights wondering why he had done it. Why did he cut his fingers off? Why? Even then as I looked upon the culmination of his life's efforts, I don't think I got any closer to knowing. A bouquet of rotten fingers was thrust into my arms with nubby hands. They were each of them stuck on skewers and tied with a florist's ribbon. The skin had been degloved from the bone peeled and scraped into tiny little petals that twisted round in their rotten absurdity to resemble something like roses. At the center of the macabre mess was a wedding ring, with blackened pieces of rotten flesh crusted onto its stalled gold veneer. I slammed the door on his face and thrust the bouquet back at him, I called the police and they took a report, but no one has been able to find Neil since. I didn't think about it then, but the question has plagued me since. Turning those rotten fingers into roses had been delicate work, a careful and precise art, not achievable by a man with no fingers. Who had carved them? Had Neil been alone in his insanity this entire time or had there been someone aiding him? I don't know if I'll ever know. My son said his first word the other day. It should have been an exciting moment, but Neil had taken even that from me. Mike gripped the side of his crib with his little perfect fingers and said to me, his face the image of his father twisted and malformed with delight. Nub. Nub. Nub.